someone help me with the uh, slides? Okay, uh, thanks for your patience. I would like to build on Antoine's um, discussion on the convergence of physical and virtual through the lens of the notion of typology, the typology of universities and how cyberspace is changing the very basic typology of an university. I think by now it should be clear that the internet will not leave architecture indifferent. The internet will very profoundly change some of the most basic activities that we conduct in daily life, including learning. There's a shift of the locus, the space where those activities are conducted from the physical to the, to the virtual. Um, this is a picture from the Berkman Center. Increasingly, students can partake in classroom teaching or lectures, such as this one, the people that are listening via streaming in a virtual space rather than using the physical space. Increasingly, students are Googling instead of going to a physical library like this one. Increasingly, students are um, making friends and falling in love in chat rooms rather than in a physical cafe or on the street. There are some economic underpinnings behind this shift from the physical to the virtual. This is a slide showing the cost differential of a transaction done in a physical space versus in a virtual space for banking. And in this case, the cost differential is not two or three or five times it is over a hundredfold. So it seems that this shift from the physical to the virtual and the disintegration of architecture is inevitable and this goes beyond the university or the classroom but you could go through any everyday uh, activity that we may conduct to look at every um, traditional physical typology such as churches and museums and prisons and there's a virtualization uh, increasingly going on. As a consequence, if you take a walk in the city, it becomes quite apparent that some of the industrial age typologies, especially the more information intensive typologies such as banks, museums, libraries and so forth, are becoming obsolete. The shift from the physical to the virtual space is probably best epitomized by a um, bookstore like Amazon.com. Currently, there are already more books sold virtual in a virtual space than in a physical bookstore. And we are just at the beginning. I mean, even Amazon is only maybe 13 or 14 years old. What will happen in 40 or 50 years or in 100 years? Will it mean that physical space will completely be obsolete? Well, in reality, and if you look at the larger city, if you look at architecture, this is not going to happen. Um, there are a new breed of typologies of architectures emerging. Some are at the back end outside the cities, such as mega fulfillment centers to fulfill what's happening in the virtual space. These are huge new typologies that could not exist in the industrial age. Or the data centers of Google would be another example. Uh, server farms. This, some are at the back end, at the background outside the city, but others are in the middle of the cities, new typologies emerging, such as this Yahoo store in New York, a physical store that enables you to go to the information space physically. All those new typologies have one thing in common, 
in that when it comes to selecting where they will be located on an urban scale, uh, what matters here is no longer access to streets or the topography, but it is really the fiber routes and the fiber nodes that become determinant for where those new typologies will happen. And this already is changing uh, the morphologies of cities. Now back to universities. Um, early virtual universities are duplicating some of the typical functions of uh, physical universities. Here we've tried to map um, the uh, functions of a virtual university platform provider, e-college, um, to a traditional university typology, the Freie Universität in Berlin. And I'm not sure if you can read it, but you have um, webcams, uh, webcasts um, replacing uh, or mapped onto lecture halls. You have uh, search engines mapped onto um, libraries. And you have chat rooms mapped onto seminar rooms. You have um, journals mapped onto study centers, and you could go on and on. But even if you consider every single virtual space that you can found, find in uh, e-college and make the subtraction, you do notice that in the end, you still have a lot of space remaining. And I think one of the questions, and this is something I think that uh, Antoine already has made allusion to, is what happens to all the activities, the informal learning, the social interaction, the character building, the chains encounters, the spontaneous um, discoveries that used to happen in the corridors and outside those official spaces. So the challenge um, will really be uh, not so much pushing into the virtual or pushing into back into the physical, but how to design this convergence in an appropriate way to leverage the advantages of both physical and virtual space. Now, how did, could this look like for universities? Um, we have made a quick survey of uh, architectural trends in universities, and from that, there's a question of what would the new typologies look like? And this is probably uh, building on John Palfrey's question this morning, that if we could build a university from scratch, how would it look like? and we could roughly classify the emerging typologies into five categories or five basic types. The first one, bricks and clicks, are the traditional bricks and mortar universities going online. So most of the universities that we have today have some form of virtual components, whether it's um, access to lectures online, um, access to course materials, that students can browse, students that sometimes are disabled and cannot go to the lecture rooms, and uh, facilitate also some administrative tasks for the universities. But so far, universities are very prudent to ec not extend these online offerings to more students out of fear for dilution of brand, but also out of uh, an uncertainty of what will happen to physical interaction if there are increasingly more virtual students. The second typology virtual campus is similar to the bricks and clicks, only that in a virtual campus not one university, but multiple universities join together to form a meta entity. So students can virtually cross register in other universities to take uh, courses, which in turn allows universities to um, focus on the strengths rather than trying to be best in everything. How this works is that a student uh, or a host university would offer a degree program that then students can take in um, different universities. An example is the Campus Virtuel Suisse in Switzerland or the UMass Online, which is an University of Massachusetts, which combines uh, BU, Amherst, Dartmouth, Lowell, and Worcester. The third typology, um, online university, is probably best epitomized by 
Jones International University, which is the first uh, online university to be to receive accreditation as a purely online university without any physical space, and this happened in 1999. Um, there are, of course, tremendous um, economies, economics because of the lower capital cost that is uh, necessary. There's no grass mowing necessary. There are no cafeteria, there are no athletic facilities and so forth. But then again, there's a trade-off of the lack of uh, this social learning experience um, that uh, is happening. Um, the future of a purely online universities is uh, still uncertain. Um, the perceived value of a degree obtained from a virtual university especially is uh, still an open question. The fourth typology is a mega university. These are universities of 100,000 and more students. Um, a good example is University of Phoenix, um, which is a university founded in 1976 and has grown ever since uh, explosively. Currently, uh, it has uh, 300 learning centers, uh, over 450,000 students, which makes it by far the largest uh, private university um, in the US. Uh, by its sheer size, there are tremendous um, economics of scale that can be achieved. Uh, at the University of Phoenix, there is a division of labor going on, so the act of teaching is divided sharply into four activities that are then performed by professional experts. So the four steps are planning the curriculum, um, creating the course material, delivering the teaching, and grading and um, evaluation. So by, by this division of labor and the sheer size, uh, the economics of scale are quite remarkable because it means that for a class for, of a basic material, um, you have an audience of 20, 30,000 and the, the budget to develop a course for that um, is of orders of magnitude higher than any universities could afford. But of course, coming from academia, there are some uh, uh, hesitations to accept uh, those kinds of um, endeavors. Um, first of all, there's a question of what happens to the universal ideal of uh, pursuit of truth when there's such a strong profit orientation. What happens to uh, a coherence of learning when there's such a division of labor? Again, what happens to social interaction when students are all distributed and uh, learning from their own corners? And finally, um, is there still a possibility of a diversity of um, alternative voices when uh, the knowledge, the creation of knowledge is completely uh, centralized? Now, finally, the last typology is that of knowledge marketplaces, which doesn't really exist. There may be a some uh, early examples, one of them we'll present tomorrow, the peer-to-peer -peer university. This is, in a way, the opposite of the mega-university. So whereas in a mega-university, the creation of knowledge is centralized, in the knowledge marketplace, the creation of knowledge is radically uh, decentralized in a way that everyone, or it's not one large university, but many small universities, almost everyone becomes a university. Um, well, to draw an analogy, if uh, the analogy for the mega universities could be Amazon.com, the analogy for the marketplace would be an eBay, an eBay for knowledge sharing. And of course, there are some challenges still for this to happen, some technology challenges. Um, how to easily index, how to easily package, how to easily uh, deliver knowledge. There are some issues of quality control and governance that has been discussed in the previous panel. And then an important issue of identity of brand when the, the, the architecture into which you subscribed to, to make it education or a degree is so radically uh, fragmentized. So a quick recap, and someone has been playing with this slide, I think. Uh, 
the virtualization of architecture as we know it is inevitable. Traditional typologies, especially of universities, are being radically transformed. And there are a couple of new typologies emerging. And this is not to say that one of them would be better than the others. There will be a coexistence of uh, different kinds of typologies. But what is important in all those typologies is really the design challenge of how to merge the physical and the virtual components together, which is the topic of this track that we will discuss um, starting today, but tomorrow and on day three. This is also the topic that um, uh, closes the circle, full circle, going back to Antoine's lecture, and I think this is also the time then to stop and open up for discussion. Any questions? Thanks so much. Uh, this, was, this was fantastic. Thank you so much to both of you, um, Antoine and Jeff. Um, the question I have, looking at some of the examples that you showed, um, What's, what do you see merge in Asia? I know we've been traveling quite a bit in China and, and um, other parts of, of um, Asia. Do you see any kind of the uh, new designs coming from that part of the world and how do they map onto the topology that you provided? Well, Asia and especially China and India are of course countries that are ideally suited for economics of scale typologies such as mega universities and that they do exist now. I think one of the largest universities is in Asia with uh, 800,000 students. But uh, what is refreshing is that there are this, this notion of uh, very decentralized universities is emerging in China. So if you ever tried to take a to learn Chinese and have a certificate in Chinese language you can, there are different sites that act as brokers to teachers, um, essentially marketplaces to, to have a conversation or to learn uh, Chinese uh, via Skype, via very simple tools. And I think that, uh, I think both will be going on at the same time. And especially the, this idea that anyone in a corner, just because they speak Chinese and someone in Europe wants to learn Chinese, that they can, there's an entity that connects them together um, is very uh, encouraging, I think. Um, Professor Fischnaller. Uh, one of my questions is, uh, when you see cities like uh, Dubai, uh, Malaysia, Cyberjaya, Putrajaya, uh, Dubai so Land, why do you uh, think it's useful to uh, but never have adopt? Been done. Uh, what do you think about, when you speak about new architecture on universities, when a city has a chance to build up a new city with new systems, have you ever thought, what is this translation in an architectonical concept? how the in university is integrated in a new kind of city when they can be new. Like we have seen the example of Cyberjaya in, in Malaysia, which has been not exactly the response of the, what was expected. And in Dubai, we have seen also the result of what has been expected. And have you have any answers to this? Thank you. Maybe this is a question for Antoine. <laughs> Well, I don't know the answer to your question, but it is definitely um, a very important one, um, just because what is happening right now in the Middle East with all the Western universities setting up satellites and uh, the big imitation of uh, Western models and uh, uh, hunger for, for, for brands coming from 
uh, so the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology, um, my school just set up a satellite in uh, Iraq, and uh, the model is really um, a completely isolated campus outside the city, which I think is not the right uh, thing to do, but this is what they want, and because this is um, what is happening, I think, of course, the, uh, the ideal situation would be to, to, to much more integrate into the, the urban fa fabric in, in some ways, right? But I'm not sure if this is the question you are, you're asking. I'm not expecting an answer because I see what are the results because I'm working in these fields. So, but I just uh, wanted to see what is your feedback on these thinkings because this is a, a big question mark uh, when universities are, because university knowledge means is the brain of the city in the future. So uh, when there is only real estate in a city's concept in the beginning, and then they build in because this is fashionable, we have to have this brand, we have to have this uh, satellite uh, university. MIT has to go to Emirates, uh, this has to go to here. Malaysia is building up new cities in this way. So it's a question of branding rather than a concept of when knowledge is really knowledge as a value. So this is what I was just hanging on on the question, on the question that uh, um, the Mr. here said before. So I'm just relating to that. So I'm not expecting an answer. I'm just mm -hmm. putting this as a sort of a question mark that should be an awareness. Yeah, I think that Antoine has uh, mentioned the logo and the danger of falling into uh, a cheap branding in a, in a way just by you know, gluing a logo of I think this is where the problem is. Nothing can define anymore what authenticity, genuineness, the sense of the place, etc., etc. Very often, attempts to be local, etc., end up in a kind of global, marketable branding attitude. So this is, uh, I don't have the answer either, but uh, it's clear that this is a question today. One may, however, wonder whether you don't have to redefine totally what local, what local means, and that's all. That's all. But architecture does matter, and uh, I, well, I, uh, I returned to Switzerland after 12 years in the U.S. And returning in Switzerland, I was always, always was reminded by what Charlie Nesson told me. What was so great about Harvard, which is its convening power. It's, it's power to convene anyone you want. It's power to convene anything, and. Um, but in Switzerland, it's much more difficult to invite an interesting lecturer, for example, or an interesting speaker. But then, one year ago, we started the building of a new uh, building, the Learning Center, the Rolex Learning Center, built by uh, Japanese architect Sejima, who also won the Pritzker Prize this year, which uh, is equivalent to the Nobel Prize in architecture. And all of a sudden, with this icon, it became much more easy to convene all of a sudden again. So I think that, in a way, design does matter, right? That if you, if you build, build something, if it's extremely well designed, it does has an effect on a lot of things. I had a question for both of these uh, interesting speakers. Um, I'm struck by the fact that the conceptions that we get from much popular culture concerning the relationship between physical space and virtual space is that uh, the person is, is completely in one or the other. And the one that one is not in, you are asleep or dead. Uh, so an examples would include um, uh, The Matrix, when the, uh, the characters are lying on a couch with a cable plugged into the back of their heads, unconscious when they're in the other place. Uh, Avatar, the most widely watched movie now, is the same thing. Uh, um, the stories that circulate 
concerning the hazards of cyberspace. The, the picture of the uh, Asian game player who falls off the chair and dies because he, I think it was a he, had spent too much time engaged in, a, in many hours of game playing. All of them imply that you are fully in one zone and non-existent in the other zone for long periods of time. Now, this seems to me wrong. Uh, it neglects, among other things, one of the central features that emerged from um, John Pelfringer Gosser's work has reported this morning about the ubiquity of multitasking and uh, continuous partial attention. But it's not just continuous partial attention across windows on your screen. It's that you're, you fade in and out of, of real and virtual spaces. And so this is all background to the question is, are architects thinking about this? It strikes me as too many of the spaces that we treat now as defaults uh, for engagement in cyberspace have given us no thought. So uh, in much of the world, the main way in which you engage in cyberspace is through an internet cafe, uh, which in most parts of, say, Latin America and Africa consists of a row of chairs, uh, not very comfortable chairs, facing a row of screens and there are people around you, but the expectation is you are unconscious of them. Uh, you just stare but straight ahead. Um, this seems to be a very impoverished notion of how you can be simultaneously in one zone or another. Uh, the ways, uh, there must be better ways of imagining environments that would be comfortable, stimulating, interesting for the people who are sometimes attending to their screens, sometimes not. Uh, some of these are arising inadvertently, not through conscious architecture in which you sit in a lounge area and you, uh, you know, sometimes you talk to your neighbors and sometimes you don't. But, but those aren't, those aren't imag created through deliberate action. They just are what happens when we plump people down. So is there more creative thought going on in architecture about this? Well, in, yeah. well for, first of all, to, to begin understanding, you have also to understand how designers very often try to think of space. They populate them with people of their imagination, etc. The design process is a process in which, in some ways, you tell a story. So part of the complexity, and this is why I ended up on the anthropological question, I think part of the difficulty we have today is that we're very much used to either to, in a way, the matrix is easy because either virtual or real, it's still very much actually the paradox of the matrix is that in the virtual world, you do not realize it's a virtual world. It's exactly as if you were in a physical space. I think the difficulty today is precisely to understand the hybrid condition, to understand that you is a body and a laptop sitting on your knee and probably tomorrow something more integrated to your clothes, etc. So I think right now architects are just beginning and this is once again why there is a massive anthropological question because we're just beginning to see that we will be designing for different people in some ways. So it's true. I think architects are more at ease these days. This is why also I mentioned terminals. There is still, you know, there is so much incertitude on what's happening to humans that things are more reassuring. In some ways, it's easier to put terminals in a room than to know exactly what this bizarre hybrid of a computer and a man, uh, how do you design for it? For he, he, her, or it, you don't even know what genre. So this is part of why it may look sometimes disappointing, but I would say there, there are fragments here and there, but we're not, you know, we don't even know even very simple questions like, for example, how do you design for teenagers? You know, but one thing is sure, uh, you know, no architect today believes in the matrix scenario because we all, you know, my son is a kind of World of Warcraft addict, but uh, still, you know, he lives in a space which is a teenager room, etc., etc., and nobody uh, except some paroxysmal situation lives in one world or the other. Because actually to live in one world or the other, it's still believing that it's the old, you know, it's the old classical world. The complexity is that we go back and forth. 
No, I think it's an excellent question, and uh, there is this dichotomy right now that you are either in one world or the other. And so, and you know, when the 3D environments, cyberspace environments, came up, there was always a discussion on whether it could be successful. But most of those 3D environments were designed by uh, ambitious uh, game designers, and who whose ambition was to get 100% of people's attention, get as much uh, immersion of the players as possible. And this turned out to be more difficult to, uh, you know, to, to, to be used than, uh, let's say, interfaces that require only 20% or 30% of people's attention, let's say, um, SMS, only, uh, you know, the digital native, uh, uh, teenagers, they can SMS with, uh, create a text message with only 5% of their attention and so forth, and they can uh, use Facebook with 25% of their attention, but to go into second life does take about 80-90% of their uh, attention, and so it's um, because just of the 3D world and the immersion and all this discussion is coming up with the 3D TV, and I, I think it is uh, a uh, difficult balance to strike, uh, of course, of the artist who wants people to have 100% of their heart in the piece and be dead bodies watching that, and of course of uh, of, uh, of designers which are more like I think architects traditionally have designed spaces that are not getting people's 100% attention. So Walter Benjamin talked about. Uh, destructedness and compares architecture to uh, art pieces, whereas the artist or a painter wants people to uh, look at the painting um, with the full consciousness. Uh, architecture can also operate on a much more uh, ambient level. Uh, at, uh, so you perceive architecture, but you do actually other things. So when you go into a nice building, you may look at it, but you're never 100% in that building. You are, okay, you notice it's 10% uh, of your attention, notice it's a beautiful building, but 90% you still chat with your friends, you eat, you take a promenade, and I think it's perhaps moving in, or could put perhaps move in the direction that you have not uh, dead bodies or live bodies, but half alive bodies. Half dead bodies. I may just add something to that. Also, the same critique could apply to online games. You know, why do we have so many medieval castle and dungeons, etc.? You know, it's not sure that the online world as it is right now is the most satisfying, the best design. Actually, I would th I would say that in terms of design, it's a it's still a very disappointing world I I in many ways. So we might want actually also to rethink how we design the virtual world. Is a copy you know, is trying to emulate totally the real world, the best solution for the virtual world is certainly not sure. I had another question for Jeff, and, and thanks again. I thought these presentations were really excellent. Um, on the emergent typologies for universities, you're sort of proceeding down from, you know, one to a thousand down to peer-to-peer you know, -peer universities where there's a lot of one-to-one -one engagement. Um, are there also typologies that go beyond that, where every person who engages is creating a new channel of learning from many different sources and many different teachers? Um, a place where the person who engages has this creative role to create what used to be the role of a curriculum designer or a teacher, saying here is a space that's going to be for learning X. Uh, and if there is, what do we call that? No, I, I, I agree. This is not meant to be exhaustive. And you it's just as a you know one of the reason actually the virtual world has copied some of the structure of the physical world is because of the constraint because it's easier and in some ways if you have a physical classroom you, you embody in the physical classroom a number of, of uh, constraints of the curriculum. 
If you have a totally virtual peer-to-peer -peer thing, you have more difficulty and you end up building something like a virtual classroom or a virtual program of some sort. So you have these bizarre relations. But there again, nothing tells the, the story is not ended yet and we might at some point see the virtual space becoming really independent from a kind of copycat. I just want to make a, a parallelism in between something very simple. Uh, when we speak about physical and virtual space, uh, my experience is I have experience in virtual reality from the cave to up to all these things. So, but uh, if I relate specifically now being in Turin where the syndrome, year of the syndrome was, if we think in the most virtual reality piece, and before we, you mentioned the castles in the medieval, I will bring up the churches in the, in the religion. So the most uh, virtual reality project, in my understanding, is the, the religion. I'm just speaking about the Christian religion in this moment, uh, just specifically. But if you think the translation of an idea and the transmission of the concept of, of a thought, I'm not saying that I'm a believer or not a believer, so no one has to be a believer, but you see the results. The same issue is the money, the value of the money is a total virtual concept, which everybody can believe and can is operating on this field. So why cannot we uh, start to think? Because now, until now, we had the challenge to make things work in technology. I mean, when we struggle from the black and white boxes moving around in real time, and we spoke about virtual reality, physical spaces and virtual reality, now we have the technology ready that we can start to think and do these things. So now we still think on the laptop, on the knees, or the mouse that we move the things around, or we now we touch or we make uh, tracking systems and things like that. So what is the moment now? I think that we have to translate our concept of thinking that we are living in our inner being, if you analyze yourself very, con uh, very strictly, uh, most of our concepts and our thoughts are virtual, and our action is a physical action, but our ideas are virtual. So in the moment we are able to we are living together with this day by day, night by night, because from the dream to the reality, everything is like in, in this relationship. But in the moment we see a machine in front of us, we expect that this machine is solving us our life. That's not true. So we have to solve our life with any machine we have in front or any things we do in front. So I think we have to go in this direction when we speak about virtual reality, when we speak about augmented spaces, when we speak all about these issues, cyberspace. Uh, we are working cyber, I'm cybering all the days through anything. If I look at some of you, it remembers me something else. Maybe I have seen in the Orient, I have seen somewhere in another place of the world. So I'm just traveling in space in my mind. So we are cyber everybody in our mind. So this doesn't mean now, now that we have a computer which makes a one or zero uh, that change our life. So we are like that and we have to understand each other. And for me, it was since I work in the computer world, and that's about quite some time, uh, I'm all the time thinking that the computer is only a medium, and we have to work with that. I was, I'm not, I'm stopping now because if not, I speak too long. Thank you very much. Right, um, a question for both of you, whoever can address this issue, about the physical space and the ability of envisioning buildings capable of adapting to different activities which would actually require different layouts. You can do that in virtual spaces and you have that need in physical spaces. So I was wondering whether there is anything envisaged towards that direction at all. So far, flexibility is more on the side of the physical space. So, well, because the virtual space is designed. Uh, and something we tend to forget is that even when we exchange things on Facebook, there is much more protocol interaction that are pre-designed by the system. So in, in some ways, part of the difficulty is not necessarily uh, you know, where you might imagine. Then a th second thing has to do with the fact that augmented reality can even demultiply what a physical space can do. 
it can connect it to other physical space remote, blah, 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 a lot of things. Uh, we're just at the beginning, and I think, Jeff, you can say something probably about immersive space and responsive space, because there are a lot of re research, for example, going on with the idea that you, you know, space used to be a somewhat passive thing, and you're going more and more to interact with it. And so the space will have program, uh, you know, will have some kind of intelligence, etc. So a lot of designers are exploring that. We're really at the beginning, and so far the space doesn't do that fantastic things. You know, it basically changes colors, sometimes form. It's not so exciting, but it's a beginning. No, I think you've heard uh, the uh, the Arduino. Uh, comp uh, Mr. Brunst is speaking this morning, and I think that as uh, computing is becoming physical, uh, there is there has come now a very interesting moment where physical com computing or physical computing is meeting architecture and uh, really challenging the the very notion of uh, tectonics of architecture as something static and making it uh, not only uh, kinetic or robotic but uh, I think what is happening in architectural research is uh, one of the trends is in cognitive architecture that architectures that can sense and uh, and respond uh, using exactly those uh, physical computing components. I have not seen applications in learning yet. I mean, there are lots of applications in, let's say, clinical medical space. You can change the, uh, the shape of a space for therapy, for example, or other applications in commercial, in stores that can change self shelf spaces. But I think it would be very interesting to think about that for the context of uh, universities and, and learning. Okay, thank you so much for this wonderful session. <laughs> now actually, I would like to invite the track leaders, therefore Urs Gasser, Jeff, and Alma Swan to please come down to the desk for um, a short summing up uh, involving the audience uh, about the major takeaway points uh, of the tra three tracks uh, and also what's going on tomorrow morning. We, have, we start the morning with uh, the breakout sessions. In your program you find, uh, please come at the desk, you find uh, the um, number of the classrooms. You will also find physical signs, not only vir virtual signs, uh, pointing you to the physical classrooms tomorrow morning. And uh, a few words from the track leaders about uh, what uh, happened today and what's going to happen tomorrow morning. And at, at the end, uh, please, let's leave uh, a few minutes, 10 minutes, the students uh, who have been uh, going around making short interviews, making side uh, kind of guerrilla uh, kind of recordings, will show a few highlights uh, of today. And with that, we will conclude this long but very interesting day. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I do not even attempt to summarize what happened today. Uh, it's certainly kind of an information processing challenge. I thought it was a very rich day. Um, lots of big picture um, ideas and topics and themes uh, that we hopefully can further explore tomorrow. As far as the first uh, track is concerned, uh, the youth or digital natives track, um, I think the overall plan is um, to have a kind of a smaller session tomorrow. Uh, obviously, these are three, I should say, um, parallel breakout sessions, so you will have to make a choice uh, which one you want to attend. Um, within the Digital Natives session, our hope will be, and Colin McClay, you should uh, explain the concept since you uh, will moderate the session. Um, we would start with um, some data that we have actually uh, from our colleagues at the Harvard Law School Library, uh, illustrating some of the usage, uh, media um, use habits and information habits of digital natives. So uh, the library has done a quite um, um, an impressive survey uh, from which we can learn a lot. We will um, hear from a couple of colleagues on this topic, uh, and then we will also um, think about and discuss some of the implications that these new forms of information behavior um, trigger for 
uh, libraries in particular. So it will try to connect a little bit this first track then also with the information infrastructure track. And the third part of the um, breakout session will then uh, move from um, the institutional to the informal. Uh, and we will have a case study looking into educational games or more broadly into games that have educational value and try to understand how informal learning in particular interacts with um, the institutional and more formal learning uh, as described in the second part of uh, the breakout session. So that's the plan for tomorrow. Of course, um, we'd also love to hear from you. Uh, tomorrow is supposed to be much more interactive than today for the design choices that uh, Juan Carlos mentioned this morning already. Um, so if you have interesting things to report, interesting data, but also interesting uh, observations or case studies from your universities or from the institutions you're working with, how these institutions have responded to the needs and changing habits um, of students, of course, we would greatly appreciate it. Uh, you know there is a wiki out there um, on the uh, Communia website and uh, any suggestions and contributions would be most welcome uh, and we would then, of course, um, uh, try to kind of integrate it in, in the game plan tomorrow. So with that, I turn over um, to you, Emma. Thank you. I think that I've been s struck today by the way that we have leapt from research to teaching and back to research and then strongly again into teaching. I hope that um, what will happen when we try to take the stuff that we've done today plus what comes out of the breakout sessions first thing tomorrow into the plenaries of which cover these cross-cutting themes that we will start to perhaps take a, a holistic approach over the university as a thing that functions as a whole. The other thing that I would say is that we need to keep in mind what, because we hope to have a practical outcome from this conference in terms of some way forward or some guidelines. I think we need to keep in mind what an individual university can do and should do and what the community of universities can do and should do. So there are two different perspectives and, and I hope that we will be thinking about that as we go through the next day or two. In terms of what we're doing in our breakout session tomorrow, we are going to try to make that a discussion session, prop a proper discussion session from which we will di be distilling or somebody will be distilling some messages to bring back here into the plenary sessions on, on these th three other themes. But we do have a series of short presentations of case studies or, or experiences um, which individuals are going to put forward. And these cover a range of things. They cover um, initiatives that universities ha have on how to open access to their work. We have a couple of presentations on some technology that libraries and individual teachers are developing ways of using um, the internet to help students to access and understand how to access and use information better. We have um, something on rights, again, a, a case study on, on how to handle that. And so I think that we are going to be revisiting the themes that we had in our session earlier today. So at the moment, I have six individual specific cases that people would like to describe in not too many words to our session, uh, which we will then use as a basis for the discussion. While I have the opportunity and I'm sitting up here so that I can plan uh, over the next few hours quite how to time that session, are there any other people here in the room who know that they would like to uh, not formally, but let's say semi-formally, offer something to that session, to the information infrastructure session tomorrow morning. Because if you do intend to do that, offer a case study or just describe your own work briefly, 
it would be helpful for me to know that now so that I can think about how to, to, to structure that session tomorrow. No, okay, so that's six. So thank you um, very much and I hope to see some of you other than just the six. I hope to see some more of you there tomorrow. So in the third track, and I think unfortunately this is not on the program, we will do a similar, more intimate discussion uh, continuing on the issues of physical, virtual, spatial infrastructure. So, but we will have, uh, so far we have two uh, presenters that will introduce concrete case studies of physical, virtual uh, learning environments or new typologies. We have uh, Giovanni from, from the architectural office, Carlo Ratti Architects, a local Torino-based practice who just won a competition to design an entire uh, new uh, physical virtual campus in northern Italy. So they will present uh, that project. And we have uh, Delia from uh, P2PU who will present uh, um, her work on the uh, creation of a peer-to-peer -peer university um, with uh, videos and multimedia from what I understand. And again, also in our session, um, we have uh, plenty of room if uh, any of you, uh, it should be a bit informal, wants to present uh, other examples, other case studies of um, emerging typologies, of spatial typologies for learning of the future. I'm just giving a very practical information that the session starts at 9.30 and they end at 10.45. And the rooms are in the program are 13A, and that's going to be for digital natives, and 15A for uh, the information infrastructure, and 21A for the spatial infrastructure. There will be physical signs uh, uh, around here pointing you to the, to the classrooms tomorrow morning. So thank you to the track leaders for a wonderful day. Thank you. Oh, if you, you want, you can stay because now we're, we're giving a few minutes to, for to the wonderful team of uh, young people from the from the engineering, media, and uh, cinema engineering at the Polytechnic of Turin. Please come because they've been going around. You've noticed them taking pictures and shooting videos and making interviews, and they're going to show you some, just a few minutes of something that happened today during the day. Thank you. Good evening, my name is Dario and uh, I'm uh, newly graduated in uh, cinema engineering here in Polytechnic of Tarin and um, I'm here to present you in a few words, um, me and uh, our team, we are Polymedia Web TV, that um, this is the Web TV of uh, our degree course and um, during uh, these uh, three days of conferences, we, we will work uh, together with um, the online newspaper, uh, La Stampa, and uh, we will um, publish uh, a video blog online uh, on which we, we will post some photos, some uh, video interview of the speakers, um, and uh, of course, some uh, articles uh, um, that we will, made in, uh, we will make in these uh, three days. So we are uh, a web TV, uh, no more talks, and uh, maybe we can start with the videos. I hope. Siamo col professor Juan Carlos De Martin, cofondatore del Centro Nexa per Internet e Società del Politecnico di Torino. Il professor De Martin è anche uno degli organizzatori principali dell'evento University and Cyberspace che si svolgerà quest'oggi, a partire da quest'oggi nell'aula magna del Politecnico. Ecco professore, noi vorremmo sapere in che cosa consiste nello specifico questo evento 
e quali sono le linee guida che animeranno le varie conferenze. Ma l'obiettivo principale è riflettere su che cosa capiterà all'università per effetto di internet, quindi provare a fare noi quello che andiamo a predicare agli altri, ormai da diversi anni abbiamo parlato spesso con l'industria musicale o con i giornali e ora che riflettiamo su noi stessi, cioè come l'università dovrebbe cambiare e potrebbe cambiare per effetto di internet e per fare questo le, si parte da che cos'è l'università, qual, qual è la sua missione, cosa siamo, cosa vogliamo essere e da questo cercare di riflettere su quale impatto potrà avere la tecnologia sui nostri obiettivi, ma prima bisogna decidere quali sono i nostri obiettivi. Un evento di questo genere potrebbe sensibilizzare, se vogliamo, la nostra classe dirigente, l'opinione pubblica nel nostro paese in cui l'università e il sistema scolastico in generale stanno affrontando stanno passando un momento di grossa difficoltà. Lei pensa che questo evento appunto, potrebbe in qualche modo eh, sensibilizzare? Appunto. Ma, eh, noi abbiamo cominciato a riflettere anche con, con il Batman Center di Harvard a questo evento prima di, che da questa crisi corrente diventasse così intensa, però effettivamente adesso che ci siamo dentro eh, ci piacerebbe che l'opinione pubblica e chi decide vedesse che l'università non è soltanto su una posizione difensiva, per quanto legittima secondo me, ma anche una posizione propositiva in cui cerca di guardare lontano, guardare a 5 anni, 10 anni anziché all'immediato. E poi, se vogliamo, dato che gli studenti saranno se vogliamo, i principali protagonisti di questa, di questa trasformazione, quali sono, visto che sono numerosi gli ospiti, da professor Stefano Dodotà dell'Università La Sapienza, a Io Ito, che è il, fonda, il presidente di Creative Commons, quali sono le conferenze che lei consiglierebbe di, di andare ad ascoltare i nostri studenti? Ma noi abbiamo pensato agli studenti fin dall'inizio in maniera proprio strutturale e l'abbiamo pensato da diversi punti di vista. L'abbiamo pensato perché i tre giorni di conferenza cercano di raccontare, mimare in un certo senso l'esperienza di uno studente che va all'università. Per cui il primo giorno è come se fossimo una matricola e ci sono le grandi lezioni introduttive. Quindi se guardiamo dal punto di vista di sostanza, invitare gli studenti a venire almeno il primo giorno giorno perché hanno un'introduzione ai grandi temi. Dopodiché, se vogliamo parlare delle cose più, più attraenti, più divertenti, più interessanti, c'è cioè sicuramente un grosso keynote di Bruce Sterling e dopodiché alcuni interventi più brevi, sempre plenari, ma di un quarto d'ora, di Joe Ito, che è il presidente appunto di Creative Commons, ma anche di Massimo Banzi, che è l'inventore di Arduino, che è una straordinaria tecnologia aperta, sia hardware sia software, che permette soprattutto per l'utilizzo di design e di architettura di fare cose molto innovative. Oppure ancora una persona che non è famosa, magari lo diventerà, che è un collega ricercatore, nonché imprenditore in Inghilterra, Carlo Fabricatore, che si occupa di videogames e formazione. Quindi sentiremo anche lui cosa, che cosa sta capitando in questo ambito. Perfetto, noi ringraziamo il professor De Martin di essere stato con noi e un saluto a tutti. Grazie a voi. So, why do you think it's useful to uh, adopt um, a multidisciplinary approach to analyze the Internet? Uh, there's no other approach. It's, it has to be. It's like the Internet touches every field. Every field has its interest. And if somehow we're to look to the future of Internet, it should be all the disciplines combined that are doing it. Mm. So, do you think also that uh, the um, university uh, course of degree should be more multidisciplinary in their approach? I'm not sure. Uh, I, I mean, yes, but I am not at the point where I could tell you exactly mm. what I'm looking for. I, we, our experience at the Berkman Center is that we started in a law school and the ideas uh, in a sense uh, stemmed from a combination of law and engineering. Mm -hmm. The idea was if cyberspace is to be built it'll be a combination somehow of law and engineering. And that broadened us out to engineering but then as soon as you have the structure you have the content and suddenly it goes to the rest of the university. And so the trajectory was to be first a law center, then a university center. Mm -hmm. And I'm feeling the same thing with Nexa, which starts mm -hmm. as uh, in an engineering environment, but is clearly going to the university.
-hmm. And so that seems to be the direction it goes. Start with something specific, but recognize the multidisciplinary qualities and move in that direction. Siamo con Stefano Rodotà, giurista e professore emerito di diritto civile all'Università La Sapienza di Roma. Ecco professore, noi ci chiedevamo, internet potrà contribuire a quel cambiamento culturale nel nostro paese in cui magari temi come la ricerca e l'innovazione alle volte sembrano non essere all'ordine del giorno del nostro governo? Beh dire che, non, che sembri che non siano all'ordine del giorno... È una frase molto generosa, non sono all'ordine del giorno. Eh, Internet può contribuire negli altri paesi, ha eh, come dire, dato una mano molto importante a trasformare il modo stesso in cui si lavora e credo che questo possa avvenire anche da noi e già ci sono segnali importanti, eh, purtroppo non sempre sostenuti da un adeguato... Eh, appoggio istituzionale ma dico questa discussione che stiamo facendo oggi l'esistenza a Torino di un centro come Nexa ci dice che anche all'interno dell'università dove c'è attenzione risultati positivi possono venire e in questo senso internet certo che contribuisce e, e lo dico l'elemento costitutivo della società della conoscenza il problema è come mettere a disposizione del massimo numero possibile di persone la conoscenza di renderla valutabile in modo critico e questo è il ruolo dell'università Lei inoltre all'interno del suo keynote ha parlato di un sapere critico un discorso peraltro molto suggestivo Ecco, io mi chiedevo, eh, questo sapere critico che quindi non è orientato a una redditività immediata, quanto si può sposare anche con un sapere, se vogliamo, multidisciplinare? Non solo si, sposa con, si può sposare, ma si deve sposare con un sapere multidisciplinare, perché se ci chiudiamo soltanto all'interno di ciascuna delle discipline che noi coltiviamo, eh, i rischi dell'autoreferenzialità diventano molto forti. Internet in questo senso è da una parte un contributo all'approfondimento della propria materia, della propria disciplina perché mi mette immediatamente a disposizione una grande quantità di materiali, ma nello stesso tempo come dire, è un mondo che mi obbliga ai link a guardare un po' al di là di quello che io ho trovato in prima battuta e che è invece attorniato da tanti altri contributi di cui si deve tenere conto. Quindi la multidisciplinarietà non solo è necessaria per la ricerca ma è come dire, il motore del sapere critico. Ecco, poi lei ha insegnato in molte università, in Europa, negli Stati Uniti, in America Latina. Lei pensa che le università italiane riusciranno mai in qualche maniera a eh, sincronizzarsi con le università più importanti del mondo? Se dovessi dare in questo momento un giudizio sarei molto pessimista perché eh, non solo non si stanno creando le condizioni per un avvicinamento, non dico alle università di assoluta eccellenza nel mondo, ma nemmeno alla possibilità di rimanere in una fascia alta e dignitosa. Rischiamo di retrocedere potentemente in situazioni nelle quali la funzione dell'università rischia di essere cancellata, cancellata per la mancanza di risorse, cancellata per la mortificazione del personale che vive all'interno dell'università e cancellata per la professionalizzazione estrema e miope. Quello che mi colpisce tuttavia è il fatto che eh, la reazione del mondo universitario, soprattutto nei suoi eh, professori, è inadeguata alla gravità della situazione. Probabilmente si sentono schiacciati dalle grandi responsabilità che hanno e che sono responsabilità del passato e oggi non ce la fanno a reagire, ma questa reazione è indispensabile. organization and uh, so the
Arduino, eh, se eh, questo progetto fosse distribuito nelle scuole e fosse... So if you want, thank you and see you tomorrow morning at 9.30. Thank you. Essendo un progetto open source non si porta dietro costi di licenze, anche l'hardware è molto economico, tendenzialmente in questo momento viene fabbricato in Italia, però se ci sono delle problematiche di costo molto...